today my message is titled Holy Spirit and we've been continuing in the message on the Holy Spirit, learning about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God and um, we're going to head into that in a moment but it's called life. But I'm going to ask you a question, how are you going church with getting to know the Holy Spirit? We've been talking about it for a number of weeks um, and then we had that little break there, Christmas and New Year. And sometimes when we have a little break, we don't bring things back to our mind. Maybe we stumble and fall a little bit and we forget. But church, I want to encourage you if that's you. If you're going strong, awesome. If you've stumbled and fell a little bit over the little break there, I want you to remember to get back up because he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And you say, oh, I haven't had time, but now I want to get to know you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to start in my quiet times asking Holy Spirit, the third person. He's a person and he wants to know you. He wants to be in intimate fellowship with you. So just be encouraged. If that's you and you haven't had a chance, I want to encourage you. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. He never leaves. He never leaves. So this morning we're going to be continuing on Holy Spirit um, and we're going to re- just review what we've learnt so far. I'm driving the remote so you might see me do this quite a bit. I'm not real good at it. Wayne seems to do it very flawlessly. <laughs> I have to make sure it's up there. So we have probably done, I guess, three or four different um, messages on the Holy Spirit. So we're just going to go through what we've learnt so far because we had that little break and just keep it in our mind. Okay, so the first thing that we've been learning is that Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God. And there'll be scriptures for each of these as we've already covered um, this content. So he's a person. We can think he's a power, something that comes on us from out here. But he's a person. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the triune God. Um, The second point there, Holy Spirit is a he The Bible tells us he's a he, not an it or a random power, some new age thing out there. He is a he, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus and is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit, that is what he does. He goes throughout the earth testifying about Jesus. That's his role. There are other roles, but that's his main role, to testify about the Son. And he is the spirit of truth. And when you became a Christian, the spirit of truth spoke to your spirit and you went, ah, I get it now. So he is the spirit of truth. And at salvation, number four there, at salvation, your spirit connects with the Holy Spirit and your spirit man comes alive. Before we were sinners walking around with our spirit man closed or dead, actually, eternally dead. But when we ask Jesus into our heart and we say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I believe that he died on the cross for me. Yes, I want him as a saviour in my life. Then your spirit and his spirit, the Holy Spirit, connects, becomes one in a union and your spirit comes alive and you are saved. We use that a lot in Christian speak. You are saved. Do You have asked a saviour in and the Holy Spirit at that point of salvation connects with your spirit and you are saved eternally. Your spirit comes alive. Who's excited? <laughs> I think you can yell and shout through whole, my whole sermon. I don't mind. Amen. Um, So that's number four. Number five, at salvation you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and adopted as God's child. So at that point of salvation, when your spirit connects with the Holy Spirit, something amazing happens, your spirit comes alive and God seals you. And he says, my child, hands off, enemy. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means no weapon formed against you shall prosper. 
because you are a child of God, sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I love that. It's so exciting to know if you have a, this is a weird, random thing that just popped into my head, but if you have a cereal packet that is sealed, nothing can get into it. It is sealed across the top. It is sealed. Nothing can come against you because you are sealed like that cereal packet. It's airtight. It's sealed. And that's what the Holy Spirit does on you. He goes, my child, sealed for eternity. How beautiful is our God. And at salvation, you are given a deposit of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. And I talked about how you put a deposit on a home. It's just a small amount. And you have the Holy Spirit, God's presence, God's Spirit living inside of you. But it's a small amount. And I love that sec- the second part there that says, until the full redemption. There is more to come, church. We have... God's presence inside of us now, and it's amazing enough, but at full redemption is coming. Are you excited, church? A full redemption is coming, and we aren't even going to comprehend it. The glory of that full redemption. The Holy Spirit indwells you. God's Spirit is housed in your physical body. God's spirit is housed in your physical body. Church, I don't think you're hearing me. (laughs) The creator of the universe who breathed life, who spoke life into being, that breathed life into Adam, indwells you. What more can you say? (laughs) He indwells you right there where you sit. If you have asked Jesus into your life as Lord and Saviour, you are sealed, you had that deposit, and he indwells you. When you leave this place, he goes with you. When you go to the supermarket, he goes with you. When you drive in your car, he goes with you. He indwells you. And number eight there. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity in unity were all in agreement that the Holy Spirit would be sent to earth and remain with believers. And we read in the scripture, that particular scripture there, Luke 24, 49, we read how it says, I'm going to the Father and then I am going to send the Holy Spirit. But we also talked about that the Holy Spirit didn't go kicking and screaming. They are in agreement, three in one. So if the Father and the Son agree to send the Holy Spirit to believers and for him to stay on earth, then the Holy Spirit is in agreement to stay and be with you and never forsake you and walk with you every single day. They are three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all in agreement And the Holy Spirit stayed for you and for me. And the last two for review. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a result of Jesus' sacrifice. I love in Titus 3.6 there, um, I haven't shared it with you, but go home and look it up. It talks about how we would not have the Holy Spirit if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Jesus. He could not leave the Holy Spirit if the sacrifice had not been perfect through his blood and his body. He couldn't have left the Holy Spirit with us, but it's because of his sacrifice that we have the Holy Spirit. And the last one there, number 10, the Holy Spirit will bring life to your mortal bodies. What a day. When our physical bodies are, uh, perish, have perished and we come alive, spiritually, 
and a physical bodies pass away. It'll bring life to your mortal bodies. I want to share a bit more on that in my, the rest of my message um, as we get into it. So that's just for review, church. We've been doing that over the past three or four weeks. So I want you to remember those things. We'll continue to look at them and remind ourselves because so easily things can slip from our mind. So easily we forget. So I want to encourage you to keep pushing in. Keep pushing into those times with him where you sit with the Holy Spirit and say, show me your truth from the word. How can I do something to bless someone today? Tell me where I need to go today. Lead me, Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us to walk in the Spirit. And the only way that we learn that is by spending time with him and asking of him. Amen. So all of those amazing things that I just shared with you, church, that's the relationship that we are blessed to have with the Holy Spirit in this church age. I have shared before that in the past, throughout history, there, there was never a time where the Holy Spirit was on individual people. Yet we have that deposit in us. And we are blessed to have that kind of relationship that I just reviewed with you. We are blessed to have that intimacy with the Holy Spirit. They never had that intimacy in times past. And so the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance as children of God. He is part of our inheritance, so he's not to be pushed to the side. He's not to be thought of as something as scary or something that's um, evil. That some people have that idea, oh, be careful, he's a bit scary. But he's not. He's part of the inheritance that we receive, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is a beautiful gift. He's a gift given to us so that we are fully aware that we are in covenant with God. I want that to sink in, church. When we have the Holy Spirit and we accept that the Holy Spirit indwells in us, that we are sealed, that we have that deposit, then we are fully aware that we are in covenant with God. Otherwise, we're just people going about our business. But we are fully aware of the covenant that I have with my God because I have the Holy Spirit in me. I have a relationship with him. I am sealed with him and I communicate with him and I have been baptized by him and I speak in tongues and I am fully aware of the covenant that I have with God. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, church, because I am fully aware that the Holy Spirit is in me. God's Spirit is in me. Who can come against me? In the natural, maybe, but in the spiritual, watch out. And I love that God makes us fully aware by that that we're in covenant with him. But church, more than that, not only are we made fully aware that we're in covenant with God, so too are the principalities and powers that are God's enemies. They are made fully aware that we are God's children. It's a declaration of war. God says, my child, filled with the Spirit, back off, enemy. This one's mine. He makes the principalities and the powers, the enemy, aware God's child. And we need to walk in that victory church. Remember that we are not in a physical, a physical battle, but we are in a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is the battle. We're not coming with guns and bombs and coming at a physical level. We're coming at a spiritual level because God has an enemy, 
And as children of God, he is our enemy. And we're coming against the things of this world that are evil. And we stand up and we speak because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And we do battle on a spiritual level. And we ask the heavens to open. To God, open the heavens and bring your goodness and your power and your freedom. As we sang this morning, our chains are gone. People need that freedom from bondage. They need salvation. And we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And we know what it is like to be set free. It's a spiritual battle. When Jesus offered himself up as a sacrifice on the cross, the enemy thought that he had won. Something in the physical is happening. I've killed him. The enemy thought he had won, but death could not hold Jesus in the grave because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is life. You have life in you, church. And that's why your physical bodies will be redeemed, full redemption, because you have Holy Spirit living in you. You have life living in you. The enemy thought, this is fantastic. I've got him. But the Holy Spirit was in Jesus, but he was also in his blood. Because as I'll share in a moment, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He did not have natural, sinful blood in his body. He had a bloodline from Abba, Father. And the power in his blood, which is what Jesus wants us to focus on this month, church, the power is in the blood. The fact that it was, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, the power, the Holy Spirit life it was in Jesus' blood. And that's what will redeem, that redeemed Jesus, that rose from the grave. How can death contain life? The grave could not hold him because the Holy Spirit he was in his blood. There was no sinful, natural blood. It was, came from the Father. And the power in the blood, the Holy Spirit in the blood, rose Jesus, brought him back to life. And it's that connection when we ask Jesus into our life and we connect with the Holy Spirit, that connection is what's going to bring us back to life. Without that connection, there is no eternal life. The Holy Spirit is life. Let's read again from Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. I love that scripture. How did the dust of the ground become alive? Church, he formed him. You think about how amazing our bodies are. The cells the parts, how they work together, how they regenerate, all of those things. Where did that come from, the dust of the ground? It tells us there in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The Holy Spirit breathed life and dust from the ground became blood and bones and flesh and organs. We can't comprehend That's the life you carry, church, because the Holy Spirit lives in you. How amazing. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he brought life. How do you have intellect? How do you have thought? How did Adam become a living being? By the presence of God. The breath from Creator. Amen. 
And that's the connection, church, we have when we ask Jesus into our heart. That connection, and he dwells within us. Holy Spirit brought life. How much more should we as believers be experiencing the life found in Jesus? If we think about that, we have life from the Holy Spirit in our spirit, connecting, indwelling, deposit, guaranteeing our full redemption. How much more should we on earth here right now be walking in life? Not worried about things in the natural, but walking with life. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I don't care about him. What I care about is that Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. How do we have that? More of the Holy Spirit. How do I walk in that abundance of life that Jesus came to give us? He has given it to you. He's called the Holy Spirit. I have come that they may have life. He left life. He sent life. The Holy Spirit is life. When we walk in the Spirit, we should just be... It doesn't mean we don't have our natural moods, I get that, church. But we should be just walking around going, wow, life, woo, life. (laughs) Stuff happens, I know. I've been through a lot of stuff. But we have the Holy Spirit life. Picks us up, go back to him, sit in his presence and ask for more. There is always more, always more. So where does that life come from, our beautiful Holy Spirit? Working in our lives when we walk in the Spirit and we know him as the third person. He's not out here, he's not an it, he's not a random power. He's a person and he's intimate with me and I know him and he knows me. That's how we get more life, church. Now, I want to have a little look now at how Jesus walked around on this earth and how intimately he walked with the Holy Spirit. Now, we can say, yeah, but he was the Son of God. But church, in his blood was the Holy Spirit, but he was still fully flesh like you and I. And at his baptism, we recognize that the dove came down and filled him with the Spirit in the same way that we can be filled by the Spirit even though Jesus, yes, was the Son of God through the, through the um, bloodline from God, he still was man. He had to come as man. He had to come as flesh and bone and blood. He had to come like that to redeem us because that's what we are. He had to come. So he was fully man, even though his bloodline was from God. And at his baptism, the dove came down and the Holy Spirit entered him because then he started his ministry at the same point as we receive that union god calls us to start our ministry it may not be a ministry up on a stage or behind a pulpit pulpit but you have a ministry you have the life in you and you have god's spirit in you and you have a ministry it's to your neighbors It's to your work colleagues. It's to the people that you meet in the supermarket that seem down and you encourage them. That is your ministry, to tell people about Jesus, how he set you free, how you have life to the full. Amen? So let's have a look at Jesus. I'm I'm going to be talking about Jesus because Jesus, um, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus was before the foundation of the earth. I'm not talking about the time from from then to creation. I'm talking about the time when Jesus, the Messiah, the promise was fulfilled and he came and manifested in history. The time not before that, the time when Jesus actually came and the promise was fulfilled. He came as a baby, okay? So I'm not talking about all of the pre-stuff before that. But let's have a look at Jesus walking with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus was... 
conceived through the Holy Spirit. We know about the, the um, Spirit coming on Mary, and she conceived a child, Luke 1.35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So from the very beginning, the conception was Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He had a deposit in his blood from Abba, the Father. Okay, he was conceived through the Holy Spirit. The second one there, Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. At that moment, he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. So he was conceived by the Spirit. He was baptized by the, by the Holy Spirit. And the next one there, Jesus was strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the same way that we can be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. When we're struggling, get in God's presence. Get in the Word. Pray. And He strengthens us. So we're going to read from Luke 4, 13 to 14. So this was the time after the temptation. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days. And then this is what happens. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Now, church, it just says there, he returned to Galilee from the desert after 40 days, being tempted by the enemy without food, fasting, and then he returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. How does a physical man do that? You've not eaten for 40 days, you're fasting, you're being tempted in the, in the wilderness, and then you return to the town full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was strengthened by the Holy Spirit. You and I can be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. So the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So Jesus was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. And in the same way, you will be raised to that physical full redemption, that spiritual full redemption, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit lives in you in the same way that the Spirit lived in Jesus. Now, as I was working on this message this week, um, the Holy Spirit actually woke me up in the morning. I've been getting up really early. It's okay. <laughs> my physical body says, no, it's not, but it's okay. My spiritual body says, yes, it's okay. But um, he's just been waking me up and telling me things. And so um, he gave me this example to share with you today. It's a funny phrase. It says, a person is the sum of their life experiences. A person is the sum of their life experiences. And what he wants us to understand today as we look at all of those scriptures and all of those things about that relationship that Jesus has with the Holy Spirit. So a person is the sum of their life experiences. So if you think about a person here in the physical um, world that we live here on earth, some of us have education. Some are highly educated, some are not so. Some of us, some of us have traveled the world and that opens up for us new and exciting things and we learn so much about people and places and we think, wow, and our worldview expands. We see things differently, okay? But if we just stayed in the same place, if we just had a low education, we stayed in the same place, we didn't do much, we didn't do much with our life, maybe we stayed in the same job our whole life, we have a smaller worldview, there's nothing wrong with those things, but just that we have a smaller worldview. And so Jesus wants us to understand a person is the sum of their life 
experiences, whether they're big or whether they're small. Your life experiences, okay, will determine um, your life. You will determine, do I stay safe? Do I explore and find out new things? Is there more for me out there? Or do I, am I just content here? So if we apply this to Jesus and we look at the sum of his life experiences here on earth, as we just did, then we have a wonderful example to follow in learning to walk in the Spirit. Jesus was conceived of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was baptized by the Spirit. He was strengthened by the Spirit. And he will be raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead by the Spirit in the same way that we will be. So if we look at that and we apply that to being the sum of his life experiences, let's see what he has to say in Matthew 9.35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. That scripture there, there are many scriptures, but that scripture there sums up what Jesus did. That is the sum of his life experiences. I'll read it again. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. That is the sum of his life experiences here on earth. He came to do that, to bring salvation, to teach, to preach, to tell the people about the kingdom that is coming, to tell them about the Father and to heal and to set people free. Heal every disease and sickness. That is the sum of our beautiful Jesus, his life and ministry. Jesus did nothing alone. He walked by the Holy Spirit and he followed the Father's will. Church, that is what we are called to do. He did nothing alone. He walked By the Holy Spirit, he was led and strengthened. Wherever he went, we know there were appointments along his path. He was interrupted by people wanting healing, and he stopped. But the sum of his life experiences is sharing the good news of the gospel, telling people about the kingdom of God and healing every disease and sickness. And he did that by walking by the Holy Spirit and following the Father's will and church. That is for you and for me. That is why the Trinity sent the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you. You are not alone in this spiritual walk. You are not alone. He will never leave you or forsake you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. And this is, this is the tricky part, church. All we need to do is surrender. And for some of us, I'm not saying anyone in the room, but for some of us, the surrender is the really tricky part. We're to surrender to his leading. If that interferes with our plans, are you going to surrender? If that interferes with, I don't know, jobs, (laughs) children, plans that I had about this, will I still surrender? For some of us, it's hard. And in certain areas, it's hard for everyone. There's some areas we just go, oh, but that's my thing. (laughs) All we need to do is surrender to his leading. And if the Holy Spirit is leading, then we are following. Not leading. If the Holy Spirit is leading, if I'm led by the Spirit, I am not leading. I am following can be hard church so I want to finish this morning with a quick look at some images of Moses's tabernacle I've shared on this a a lot but there's just so much in the tabernacle and it talks about Jesus so if you're not familiar with it 
This is the tabernacle of Moses, so the Israelite people had this in their camp. Okay, and um, I'm only going to briefly talk about it, but there's so much I could talk on it. So the tabernacle was where the presence of God dwelt among the Israelite people. So we'll talk more about it um, as I get into it. But the presence of God was in that tent. He dwelt in there. And this is prior to Pentecost, church, because right now you are the tabernacle. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. But before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit was poured out on all people, before then, the the Spirit of God dwelt in the tabernacle, in that tent. But now the presence of God lives in us individually. Hallelujah. No one's excited? (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) All right, so briefly, let's look at the picture. So there's an entryway, and there is only one way to enter that tabernacle area, that courtyard first, and the Bible tells us there is only one way to God, one way through Jesus. And so this is a representation. There's so much to draw out of it, church, but it's a representation of Jesus and all the parts that God wants us to understand. So there's one way, one door, one way. The world will tell you there's many ways. There is not. One way. One entry, one door, one gate. His name is Jesus. Amen. Then there's the outer court. You can see inside that there's a fence around there. There's an outer court. That's called the outer court. And then the tent itself is divided into two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place, or we call it the holy of holies. So all of these things reflect our relationship with Jesus. They talk about Jesus. There's so many meanings you can draw out of all of these things. But I want us to just to look at our relationship with our Savior today, with Jesus who saves. Okay? So let's start in the outer court. You can sort of briefly see it there, the smoke, and then after that. So there's one way in. You can see them going into the, into the outer court. And then there's a box. That's the altar of sacrifice. That's where the the animals were sacrificed, their body and their blood. Now, church, if we're thinking about this in terms of our salvation, we enter only through Jesus, the door. We go to where that altar is, the body and the blood, the blood. We can only enter into relationship with Jesus by the blood by his body and blood. So the altar of sacrifice is where they burnt um, and slaughtered the animals. The lambs, our lamb of God, Jesus. So we can only enter into that courtyard through Jesus by his body and blood. Are you with me, church? No blood, no covenant. We sit here today under the covenant of grace. No blood, no covenant. So we must, this is our relationship with Jesus. This is salvation. We must enter through Jesus. We must accept the blood and the body of the sacrifice, that first altar of sacrifice with the the smoke going up. The next thing is the laver. It was full of water for washing and cleansing. So our relationship with Jesus, we go in through the gate, we accept the body and the blood, we go to the next level, which is the laver for washing and cleansing, and that is where we receive forgiveness of sins and are robed in righteousness. And we are saved. We're inside that outer court. It's surrounded by a fence. We are saved church. In that outer court, you can live your whole life saved, not having ever entered into that temple we'll talk about in a moment, but you are saved. Remember, you are sealed, and so there is a fence around that tabernacle showing us we are safe through the body and the blood, through the cleansing, my forgiveness of sin, I am redeemed, I am brought back. We call that reconciliation with God. I am reconciled back to God. Those two things alone, I am saved. But in God, there is more, church. There is always more. Because his heart is to be intimate with you. So right 
then and there you can choose, I accept Jesus and I can hang out in that outer court and I can be saved and I'll have eternal life and I will go to heaven, but I will miss out on intimacy with God if I don't move into the more. So the next place is the holy place. So that's just the outer court. And you can see there the two rooms, the holy place. The priests were the only ones to enter. You are priests. The Bible calls you a kingdom of priests. When you ask Jesus into your heart, you become part of the kingdom. And so only the priest could go into the holy place. And in there, there are three pieces of furniture. There's a table of shoe bread, which is communion. It has wine and bread like we had this morning. It has communion on it. And then we have menorah, which is the light. And the light reflects, um, the light is illumination of the word. You get revelation in the light. The Holy Spirit shines the light on the word of God and you receive revelation. So there's three pieces. There's, there's the table, which is communion, the menorah, which is revelation of the word. And right before that veil, you can see that, that uh, curtain is the table of incense, and that's prayer. It says that the prayer is going up from the people and God's prayer mixing to create a beautiful fragrance of prayer. Incense is the prayer of the people. Now, church, we can stay in the outer court and be saved and be secure and know that we are going to heaven, that we have eternal life, but God wants us to enter into the holy place and have communion and read the word and pray and enter into a place where we know more about him. That is the place where is sanctification with God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's where the, the Holy Spirit unites himself with us to, in that personal relationship. When we read the word and we, it's illuminated for us, when we pray, we spend time in his presence and we take communion, what is happening? The Holy Spirit is working in you, drawing you out of the natural and into the spiritual. You are spiritual beings at salvation. And he says, draw near to me. Come into the holy place. I want to know you more. I want you to know me more. Come into the holy place. And that is the sanctification with God, where it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's where you're built up, where you're strengthened, where our relationships with God begins to be set apart. I can hang out in the outer court and I'm saved, but there is so much more, church. There is so much more. And he says to you today, enter in. And then we can go to the next one, the Holy of Holies. Now, only the high priest was to go in there one time every year and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. There is no light in that room. It's completely covered and dark. But church, there was a light in that room. The glory of God. The presence of God dwelt in that room upon the mercy seat. And so in the Holy of Holies, behind that curtain, which we know that was torn from top to bottom at the cross, revealing the Ark of the Covenant. So we're in there, we're in, in unity when we're learning about things in the holy place and God says, I'm going to rip this curtain so you can actually walk in to the throne room of God, to the holy of holies. And behind that curtain that was torn, that veil that was torn, was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant had the things of the law inside, hidden, but on top was the mercy seat. The mercy seat, you can see the light shining on it there where the glory of God shone through the blood. No blood, no covenant. Where there's blood, there is covenant with God. And the glory of God shone through the blood because the blood was acceptable. Thank you, Lord. So the cherubim were on either side, you can see in the picture. And it says that in the scripture that um, their wings are upward, forward, and they, they're over the top of that mercy seat, but their eyes are down on the mercy seat. They're not looking around. Their eyes are focused where the presence of God is, 
where his mercy dwells and the glory of God shines through the blood. They didn't go in and wash the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant every year. We know that that must have been putrefied blood, you know, over and over. But it wasn't because the glory of God shone, shone up through the blood. We know that we'd go straight in there and want to wash it off, clean it up. But the presence of God dwelt there and he is holy. And he found the blood acceptable. That mercy seat, and I'm finishing church, that mercy seat, mercy in Hebrew is the word elios, which means covenant loyalty or covenant love. So when he tore that veil, church, and we can now enter, he says, there's more intimacy. You are in the holy place, but I want you to come closer. I want you to come into the more. I want you to come towards the mercy seat. And like those cherubim, put your eyes on my mercy. Put your eyes on the glory. The presence of God dwells here on that mercy seat. And that word mercy, as I just said, is defined by loyalty to God's covenant. When I know the covenant that I have, the covenant of God living inside of me, there is life. And I can enter into that throne room and I can have my eyes on the Father, the presence of God that's dwelling right there in that throne room. And there is more, church, so much more. How amazing that intimacy and beauty and majesty in that secret place, the Holy of Holies, where you come before our beautiful God. There is life in that Holy of Holies church. In the presence of God, there is life. John 6, 63 says, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Choose life. The Holy Spirit is a beautiful gift. He draws us from the outer court. He draws us into the holy place. He draws us into the throne room, into the very presence of God. That's where the Spirit of God dwelt, in the throne room. And his beautiful mercy heart...